Okay, so it's day 153 in Ukraine, 153 days, July 26, 2022. Um, the map hasn't really changed. There's been limited uh, strikes in, in different places, but it's not uh, it, it's not significant. No real estate has changed ground. Now, watch what's happened here. So let me start before I do anything to remind you of just how horrible this is. 358 children have died since the war began. 690 children have been injured. We're not talking about combatants. We're talking about children. That's the ground truth. That's what's going on there. Okay, so the ISW says, and I was talking about limited strikes, Russian-backed proxy leadership continues to enunciate deadlines. Hey, we're going to do this by this time. But they also say Russian forces remain unlikely to occupy significant additional territory. You only have so much bandwidth, so you can only do so much. Uh, they talked about conducting a limited attack, a different limited attack here, an another limited ground assault here. And they just don't have the momentum or the ability to keep carrying and pressing this on. Um, in another place, uh, here's Interfax Ukraine, Odessa region, a missile strike using strategic aircraft. And then you see this in the Guardian again and again, missile strikes here, missile strikes there. It's easy to just lob a missile. It's harder to conduct a ground campaign. So Russian forces have attacked Odessa region, striking private buildings, Russian shelling in Ukraine's southern city of Mykolaiv, uh, residential center, uh, area in Ukraine's largest city of Kharkiv. Russian. Uh, so it's just one thing after another. Now, this one's interesting. Russia's moving convoys of military equipment to Kherson, Ukraine's military claims. And that's interesting because if they're moving it there, then they recognize that the threat is not so much here where they have to have it, but they have to expand out the map and they have to actually bolster here because that's where Ukraine's going to be attacking. Okay, so that's what's going on there. There was an interesting article uh, there's a couple interesting articles about Kherson, and Kherson's going to be kind of the focus as far as the Ukrainians are concerned. Uh, the first phase of the war in Ukraine, the decisive weapon was arguably the British-made uh, law, the anti-tank bazooka. But now the talk is of the impact of the U.S.-made hammers. Okay, now the thing with Kherson is that it, it's it's been held. It's, it's largely intact because the uh, Russians uh, held it from the first week of the war, but what's going to happen to Herzan, I think, is going to be very bad because what the what the Russians generally do is destroy a city. Here, if cutting off the city by destroying the bridges is challenging, then capturing it, given the remaining civilian population, will be harder. Russia has shown itself willing to destroy cities such as Mariupol and Severodonetsk before capturing them. So it, it might be very bad for the residents of Herzan. Now, we're talking about Himmers. What's the difference between the Russians just lobbing missile after missile at a city just to destroy it and what Himmers do? Okay, in the occupied era, uh, southern Kherson Oblast, posters appeared in July featuring a picture of Himmers systems with the words threatening retribution on the Russians for looting, killing, rape, destruction. So, the agreement to unblock Odessa would have been impossible without Himmers, said Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielis Landsbergis. Um, and then when you look at what a Himmer does and how it does it and how far it can project power, it's really been pretty awesome because it's actually, you know, caused the Russians to think, hey, you know what, we got to back off some and we got to get out of their range. Uh, so that's that's part of what's been going on here. Himmers, along with GMLR uh, achieve remarkable strike pre precision, said Konstantinos Gervus, who teaches advanced weapon systems at the Hellenic Army Academy. The Russians have nothing equivalent because these systems were deployed. Now, this is really interesting about Himmers. I didn't know this, but I found this fascinating. They were developed by the Americans as sort of a sniper artillery for the U.S. in difficult environments like Fallujah in Iraq, where you had to hit the target exactly because it was surrounded by civilians. So, because of the way that the U.S. views war, which is very different than the way that the Russians view war, they the Russians will just pummel an entire city. Don't worry about civilians or whatever. We're just bombing them into submission. The U.S. was looking at it like the bad guys are in that building. We don't want to kill the people over here, 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 or here. We want to kill the people in that building and only that building. And so they developed these precision strike weapons. And so that's what Himmers do. 
Now, the psychological effects of Russian, uh, of Russian soldiers knowing that they can be attacked far behind the lines of contact are incalculable. And so the Himmers are having a tremendous effect um, and it's changed the, the game on the field, but it's yet to be determined like how that's going to actually play out if the Russians are chased out of Kherson, the Russians' tendency is just going to be to bomb the city into oblivion. So um, they have to keep up the pressure once they get the city. Okay, here's another article. Russian forces take Volkhorska power station. Please forgive me. I'm an American. I'm not, I'm not Ukrainian. I don't claim to be anything like that. I'm half Irish and half German, and I grew up in the United States. Uh, Russian forces take this power station under total control. Now, this is an article in, Pro uh, article in Pravda, so I'm taking it with a grain of salt, and I haven't seen anything in Western press about it, but they said this, and this is why I'm, I'm showing this article. The Russian troops, comma, units of the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republic, comma, as well as volunteer formations, comma, took control of the strategic thermal power plant. Now, the reason that I articulate it, even putting the commas in it, is because it's not just Russians fighting, it's Russians, and it's the recruits, and it's the contractors. And so I think there's something there about when the U.S. is saying 15,000 dead Russians, they're not including the Luhansk recruits, they're not including the volunteers. Uh, and so the, the numbers are almost double that for those killed in the war on the Russian side by the Ukrainians, and I think that's what largely what could account for that. Okay, the uh, power station, the strategic significance of which is comparable to that of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, has been taken under complete control of Russian as well as units of allied forces. I don't know if that's the case, but my point here was not to show that that is a true fact because I don't believe Pravda any further than I can throw it, but to show about like who's fighting, like there's this um, almost like they called it allies, right? The the allied forces of uh, Russia and the, the uh, Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics, as they call them, and the contractors. So that's what's going on there. Okay, next. Uh, this is also RT, and so take it with a grain of salt, but hear what, what they're saying in here. So um, we know that Sergei Lavrov is in Africa on this goodwill tour trying to make its charm offensive trying to make friends with these african nations 17 african nations voted to abstain one voted w against the u.n resolution condemning russia early on in the war so here uganda is seeking closer cooperation with russia and refuses to fight other people's enemies so other people i think means the united states or the west and we're not refuses to fight their enemies Okay, here we go. We want to trade with Russia, and we want to trade with all countries of the world. We don't believe in being enemies of somebody's enemy. We want to make our own enemies, not fight with other people's enemies. This is our doctrine, stated the Ugandan president. Now, that's generally a pretty fair standard, and I can't fault him for generally thinking that. Although, if you look at the justice of the matter of what's going on in Ukraine after being just, just uh, overrun by a big bully... Uh, maybe, maybe in Uganda, you don't have the horsepower to stand up to that. Um, in the U.S., we look at that as a, a terrible assault on people's freedom, and that's how we process it. So I, I get what he's saying. Um, okay, let's keep going. The African leader noted Russia and the Soviet Union before it had supported Uganda and the African anti-colonial movement for over 100 years and never caused the country any harm. Okay, that's true. Russia did not colonize in Africa. Russia tended to colonize its ne next door neighbors like Nova Russia, which is now Ukraine, and try to, you know, fold them into part of what Russia was. So it didn't cause them harm, but that doesn't mean they're not a, a scorpion that would cause you harm if they could. Uh, he also insisted that he didn't understand the calls for Africa to automatically take an anti-Russian stance. Okay, I mean, from where he is, he said he's not pro-East or pro-West, but pro-himself. Now, that's interesting. And again, I don't fault somebody for having that kind of standard. Now, but what's interesting about that is he, Lavrov is going to the places right now that he thinks he's going to accrue the, the quickest amount of allies. And this, not pro-East or pro-West, and that's what happened over here in Egypt as well. Um, 
when he was in Egypt, he was, you know, trying to draw them over into the fold. And they're like, look, we're, we're kind of neutral. I mean, we, we like you. We're, we're just, we're, we don't want to isolate them. So he's not having a su the success that he was hoping to have while he's on this goodwill charm offensive. Okay. While we're at that, we're seeing other shifts. So Russia is looking down to Africa. Uh, Zelensky had the first conversation in the history of Ukraine-Uruguay relations with president of Uruguay. Um, and we're grateful for condemn, uh, condemning Russia's aggression and supporting Ukraine and its international organizations, he said. And he urged Uruguay, uh, like other Latin American states, to impose sanctions on the aggressor. So <laughs> the whole situation is just fascinating what it's doing to the world itself. I mean, how Russia's reaching out here. Uh, and, you know, you can reliably count on Russia to reach out to Syria and Iran and China and uh, North Korea and other world bullies, right? Like bullies, dictators like to hang out with other, other dictators. But you wouldn't necessarily have seen them going down to Africa, just like you wouldn't have seen Zelensky reaching out to Uruguay. Russian gas cut to Europe hits economic hopes after Ukraine grain deal. Okay, so th there have been high hopes that we would resolve this crisis or that crisis, the gas supplies or the, the grain or whatever else, and it would start to resolve it uh, throughout the West. Now, the West is, is splintered into two, two factions. There's a peace faction, a peace wing that just wants the war to end, and then there's a punish Russia and don't let them do this again wing. And they aren't necessarily the same people. There might be a little overlap, but it's not necessarily the same. Uh, but the peace wing is very disappointed. Russia will further cut gas supplies to Europe in a blow to countries that have supported Kyiv, as there was hope on Monday that Ukraine's blocked grain exports would resume this week, right? I mean, so Russia, what are you doing sending that missile in there? Well, they were sending a message. That's what they were doing. We're still Russia. We can still do this and try to stop us. The Ukrainian military reported widespread Russian artillery barrages in the east overnight, and I just talked about that. Um... Now, here's what's interesting. On Monday, Russian energy giant Gazprom cited instructions from industry watchdogs that gas flows to Germany through Nord Stream 1 pipeline would fall to 33 million cubic meters today. So what's that mean? So much of the West in Europe is dependent at least partially and in many places largely on Russian gas. And they shouldn't have been doing this. They gotten themselves kind of in a fix because of that. Now, uh, because of that, they need to be able to heat their houses in the winter and to run their energy and that kind of thing. And so Russia, which is also dependent on them, but in a backwards way, one third of Russia's budget is dependent on energy. Like one third of Russia's total government budget comes from energy sales. So while they're trying to hurt the West until they can sell it to Africa and Asia and other places, they can hurt themselves in the process. It's like, who can take more punishment in the meantime? Okay, so, but when they cut this gas, this is half of the current flows, which are already only 40% of normal capacity. So they're now at 20% of normal capacity. And prior to the war, Europe imported about 40% of its gas and 30% of its oil from Russia. So that's that's what's going on here. The Kremlin says that the gas disruption is a result of maintenance issues and Western sanctions, while European Union has accused Russia of resorting to energy. So whatever the Kremlin says, I just immediately discount by half and then half again because they lied, like, like they lied about Odessa. Uh, the missile strike in Odessa was simply, um, uh, what, what was it? It was hitting a uh, military installation and a uh, Ukrainian naval boat where it wasn't that at all. It was like just hitting some infrastructure that was civilian minding its own business sitting on the side. It wasn't wasn't that at all. But they lied to Turkey that it, it wasn't us and then said afterwards, oh yeah, we, we sunk a naval boat and military infrastructure and it wasn't that at all. So Russia tends to lie about stuff and when they continually lie, you can't really trust them. Okay. Council of EU extends sanctions by another six months. This is not a surprise. The council stay, uh, today decided to prolong six months until uh, 31 January 2023. Now, that could change depending on how things events go in the war, but right now it's extended for another six months. Um, now, uh, the EU also looking at uh, taking Ukraine into the European Union. The EU high representative 
um, said that despite the challenges, including those coming from Russia, Ukraine has taken important steps in implementing the association agreement. They are. They're moving headlong. They're doing it very quickly. The EU will continue to support Ukraine in its European path. And they specifically cited areas of anti-corruption that Ukraine has been working on very consistently trying to work out. Uh, and, and this is a big part of what they need to do in order to get to uh, full compliance with the EU. They concluded the European Union will continue to support Ukraine. Okay, so that's the EU. Now, over in Russia, far from Ukraine, on the eastern side near Japan and North Korea and over on the Chinese border, far from Ukraine, Russia plans a big eastern war games next month. They've done this in the past. This is no surprise, but the timing is hard for Russia to actually make this happen. Uh, Russia plans to hold strategic military exercises in the east of the country. Uh, the defense ministry said on Tuesday, thousands of miles from the war in Ukraine. Now, this is intended to send a message that this costly five-month war in Ukraine, this special military operation, is just a little tiny special military operation. It's, it's not going to affect business as usual. After all, we're Russia, and we're huge and awesome, and we can, we can do this too. A lot of troops and gear from the eastern uh, military district have already been deployed, rotated, lost, or killed in Ukraine. So it's going to be interesting how that plays out. Now, the last time they did this, they had a huge drill. Uh, the a Vostok drills in 2018 took place on a massive scale with nearly 300,000 troops reported to be involved. And the Chinese army was even involved in, in the, the war gaming. Uh, I doubt that they can kind of pull off the same kind of scale, but we'll see what they do or if they just have like really old men driving tanks um, in order to do it. Okay, so the last few articles are from Pravda and RT respectively. Um, if Ukraine, this is uh, Pravda saying if Ukraine fails, Herzan region offensive, Kiev regime will capitulate. Okay, well, uh, it's of paramount importance for Kiev not to let the popular vote in Herzan happen. That is true. Okay. If he loses the game, the region will become a Russian territory. Okay, so they are trying to prevent that. So Sergei Khan noted on Sunday that a turning point on the battlefield has come. We are moving from a defensive to a counteroffensive actions concept on Ukrainian tele television. Now, Ukrainian media outlets have been advertising this offensive for a month already. It's not been a month, but they have been over the last few weeks saying, like, get out of Herzan if you can. We're uh, counteroffensive is coming. Now, <laughs> Here's where it gets weird. From a military point of view, an offensive requires a certain level of operational art, training of troops, and available material. Say the Russians, who have been pantsing themselves on the world stage about how well they have done a military operation. Anyway, uh, according to experts, the armed forces of Ukraine does not have enough capacity available. Well, this is according to Russian experts. Um, I'm not sure that that... that it, thought is shared in the West. An unsuccessful offensive is fraught with huge losses for the armed forces of Ukraine. It may also cause the entire front to collapse. Wishful thinking. I, I highly doubt that that's what's going to happen. Um, but if the Ukrainian offensive in Kherson region fails, the Kyiv regime will fall. Moscow is waiting patiently for Zelensky to go for it. Um, okay, so this is what and I highlight this because this is what they're reading in Russia. This is just the English translation of Russia's Pravda. So, uh, okay. And then the last one is, what is this rules-based international order that the West elites keep talking about? Okay, we talk about the rule of law. What is this rule of law? America and its allies love to invoke code words for you are free to do as we tell you to. No, <laughs> that's not what the rule of law is. The rule of law is that you don't just knock over your neighbor for no reason. Um, we respect one another in certain ways. We have a law of the sea. We, we are obeying international um, contracts that we have gone into with the UN or others, things along those lines. Okay, at any rate, what exactly is this world order? Why can't Western officials stop invoking it? And what does the conflict in Ukraine have to do with it? So if, if you don't have a world order, you just have the law of the jungle, right? And where might just makes right. And so if you want to go there, we can go there too. But I would argue that it's better to have the rule of law where we just don't do that, where we separate 
at ourselves from that kind of thing. Okay, in short, it's a vision of a world that's Western-led with a dominant classic Western values of economic and trade freedom serving as a foothold for spreading political freedom to the ultimate benefit of the average citizen, at least in theory. So it says that it's going to do this, but it really doesn't do that. It's what it's saying. By the way, it's Western dominant. If you roll back the clock, the Soviet Union had a Soviet dominant, like we were going to spread Soviet communism throughout the world. So that's what it used to be. And when the Soviet Union broke up, Russia's like a third of that and is no longer the big player that it once was. Okay, at any rate, the reality is much more complicated. All too often, the spreading of freedom hasn't been free, at least for the average person. And they go on and belabor that. But they continue and they say this, the world order has also historically implied an unequal east-west bipolarity with the west historically seen as dominant now but this is not necessarily the case like america would have loved for russia to have after the fall of the soviet union converted and just become a a competitor democracy um doing democratic things but that's not what happened and so uh, if you're going to continue to be a threat and saber rattle, yeah, but not because we wanted that. We we wanted you to become, you know, the, the, the big democracy over in the region. Okay, the conflict in Ukraine risks creating an ultimate nightmare for Western elites, an alternative group of allies over which the West has no control. And that's what Russia is trying to do by going into Africa and going into other parts in Asia and trying to to expand the BRICS into uh, let's bring in Argentina and Iran and uh, and trying to create its own block, okay? But which has the capacity to offer citizens of the world economic opportunities that are competitive with what their own governments or countries are offering. Mike Pompeo, former CIA director, former Secretary of State, recently told Washington Think Tank, by aiding Ukraine, we are undermining the creation of a Russian-Chinese axis bent on exerting military and economic hegemony in Europe. Okay, so that, that is true. They are doing that. They're using his words against him. But it is to... I mean, part of fighting in Ukraine is not just to protect the Ukrainians, but to punch the Russians so many, so many times that they don't think about doing this to anyone else. I mean, that is true. Okay, events in Ukraine and Western sanctions resulting from it are serving to catalyze the development and implementation of a parallel Eastern or Southeastern offer with the alternative systems and structures so they're trying to create this alternative to the g7 that that's the idea uh and so that's the way that russia is viewing this this is what they're hearing in russian news services so that's what's going on today tuesday july 26th thank you for your time and I'd love to hear what you think about this. Uh, are, are these updates helping you? Are, are they useful? What else would you like to hear? 